So good afternoon. I am Mary Krogan, Provost and Executive Vice Chancellor for UC Davis. It is my distinct pleasure to welcome you to the fourth and final event in the 2021-22 season of the UC Davis Forums on the Public University and the Social Good. We are very grateful that we are able to hold this forum in person and we wanna thank those of you who are here in the room as well as those who are attending virtually on Zoom. The UC Davis Forums was established in 2012 by our former Provost and Executive Vice Chancellor, Ralph Hexter. The Forum Series seeks to promote informed and thoughtful dialogue among members of the campus community and the public, with the goal of helping the public university best serve society and individuals. The series poses the following question, what should and can the public university be in the 21st century? You can find information about all of our forums along with videos of past events on the series website. The address is forums.ucdavis.edu. This afternoon, we are delighted to welcome as our featured speaker, Eddie Como, professor of higher education and policy at the University of California, Riverside. He is also the founding executive director of CARE, the Center for Athletes' Rights and Equity at UC Riverside, where racial equity and policy issues in higher education are central to this work. The topic of Professor Como's lecture today is the fire this time, advancing equity and opportunity for vulnerable athletes in college sports. By focusing on the challenges facing vulnerable student athletes and ways to surmount these challenges, this forum will shed greater light on a subject that is integral to the larger discussion about student diversity, equity, and inclusion, and has long been of keen interest across academia. Immediately following Professor Como's presentation, there will be a Q&A period led by Professor Scott Corral. Before our speaker is formally introduced, I want to thank the following individuals and groups who have made this event possible. First, the UC Davis Forum Steering Committee, led by Martin Kenny, Distinguished Professor of Community and Regional Development in Human Ecology. The other members of the committee are Professors Ra Raquel Aldana, Scott Carell, Masela Quaylar, Jonathan Eisen, Ralph Hexter, and Maisha Wynn, and the series coordinator is Emily Hovda. I also want to thank the Community and Regional Development Program in the Department of Human Ecology, which has joined the Office of the Provost in co-sponsoring this event. My sincere thanks to all of you in the audience for making time in your busy schedule to join us today. And with greatest appreciation, Professor Como, for sharing your knowledge and insights on a topic that pertains directly to the responsibility of higher education institutions to create the conditions that will allow all students to excel, succeed, and thrive. Now, I will yield the podium to Scott Corral, Professor of Economics, co-faculty director of the California Education Library, oh, Laboratory, and the faculty athletics representative at UC Davis, who will introduce Professor Como. Thank you. Thank you, Provost Cohen. Um, it's my distinct pleasure to introduce Eddie Como. Uh, he is as you know, a professor at UC Riverside who studies higher education. He's also a grad of our other sister universities, uh, Cal Berkeley and UCLA. And perhaps it should be our goal to maybe get him up here someday uh, to, to have his fourth stop at a, at a UC. In addition to his work on student athlete uh, rights and equity, where he founded the Care uh, Institute at UC Riverside. Uh, Professor Como has published an astounding 75 peer-reviewed journal articles and has written five books. He also has been featured in the Wall Street Journal, the Washington Post, the Chronicle of Higher Education, and many other popular press. And he's a two-time winner uh, of awards from the American Education Research Association. 
But most importantly, he's here to talk about student athlete welfare, and he comes from a perspective of not only being a student athlete himself at the college level while playing baseball at Cal, but also spending four years as a professional baseball player in the Texas Ranger institution, organization. But he probably is most proud uh, now that he's a father of a six-year-old baseball player. And uh, as we had our meeting, you know, they're in first place in, in the Little League uh, standings. And so, as he mentioned, he's a part-time researcher and a full-time coach. So with that, uh, we're excited to hear about what you have to say about student athletes, uh, their welfare, uh, and most importantly, uh, your perspectives uh, on the coaching side as well. With that, please in, uh, in, uh, like to introduce Professor Eddie Como. Thank you, thank you, thank you so much uh, for that introduction. Um, I'm a walker, folks, um, uh, so I'll be walking around a little bit. Um, but let me give a few shout outs. Um, I definitely got to give a shout out to, to Emily uh, for keeping me on schedule and making sure that I'm able to, uh, to, to, to make all these meetings and have these wonderful conversations with the UC Davis community. Um, Provost, uh, Thank you uh, so much uh, for this invitation. Uh, I've been looking forward to this. I enjoy talking about the role of athletics uh, in American higher education. Um, as I mentioned, I had some wonderful meetings today. Uh, I got to give a shout out to the brilliant Dr. McCall Kurlander. Uh, we had a chance to catch up. Uh, I consider her a dear friend. Uh, so that was wonderful for breakfast uh, to be able to hang out. Um, as well, I was able to hang out with uh, some of your student athletes. Um, and, and engage in conversations. They were able to tell their stories about their journeys as, as college athletes and hopefully uh, some of the suggestions and uh, hopefully words of wisdom um, they'll be able to take with them. Um, and then just the, the athletic staff. Um, we were able to have some really candid conversations about the athletic enterprise um, and ways in which we can enhance um, the system, uh, creating more equitable pathways for, for, for all those actors all those stakeholders who are involved. And so, wonderful opportunity um, to engage in conversation. So I'm looking forward to a presentation um, that, that is really framed around how we create more e equitable pathways um, for college athletes. Now, um, the title here, The Fire This Time, um, is really borrowing from what I, who I would consider one of the most towering um, intellectuals of our times. Uh, James Baldwin, he wrote a wonderful piece in 1963 uh, called The Fire Next Time. And we interpret that title to mean that we will bring fire to much needed change to our social structure. Um, Baldwin uh, understood, he was critically aware that of the structural positionality of blackness. Um, he understand that for change to happen within our social structures, um, we needed to address inhumane policies, particularly economic policies, as well as practices of state-sanctioned violence and social exclusion, rather than um, to integrate in what he called a burning house, right? And so as we think about college athletics today, the spectacle, the pageantry, the increasing commercialization uh, of college athletics, right? Rarely do we talk about those tensions and contradictions, right? Uh, those tensions that, that, that exist within our landscape. Rarely do we talk about those inequities, those racial inequities. And so today, I'm here uh, to talk about those inequities. I'm here to talk about um, how many people benefit uh, quite handsomely from the enterprise on the backs of athletic labor. But I'm also here to talk about an equitable path forward, right? Acknowledging the structure, acknowledging the inequities, but also thinking about how do we create a more hospitable environment uh, for our vulnerable athletes. And so, as I think about this presentation, 
Uh, I want to talk about my journey. I think it's central to why I'm standing here today as a former student and athlete, but also um, in the role of an educator. I also want to talk about the contradictions of the NCAA uh, and member institutions, the amateur ideals, um, the corporate university, and I'll talk a little bit more about that, the experiences of our vulnerable athletes, and lastly, um, I'll say the so-called academic reform. And ultimately thinking about how does the current structural arrangement impact outcomes across racial groups, which would be important for me um, to argue that the system is irreconcilable based on those outcomes. And what might we do for our most vulnerable actors, um, our athletes, to ensure that at least they're in a system where there's healing opportunities, there's sites of humanness, there's mechanisms that we can actually change the current system. So, you know, as someone who studies college athletics, who, um, you know, I'm a full-time coach, I, 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 I will admit that. Uh, it consumes a lot of my time and energy, uh, along with the writing, the research as well. So I'm serving in double duties here. Um, but just to get my audience uh, involved somewhat, when you hear someone say college athletics or student athlete, um, what comes to mind for you? Time management. Time management. Time management. What else? I know we've got some student athlete parents in the room, former student athletes, current student athletes. What comes to mind when you hear college athletics or student and athlete? I think about the money of big, like, big Power Five programs and the economics of it. The economics of it, Power Five conferences, okay. The arms race, right, where there's They're considering a correlation between how much money you invest in the program and winning, right? Which doesn't always pan out. Uh, anything else come to mind when you think about the athlete? I think that when you compare college sports, like just the community building and all the, the ways that it really creates amazing for the school, too, that's a lot of how schools are known is by their college sports. So that's why there's a lot of money involved in it, especially for big programs. Absolutely. Uh, College athletics is a source of entertainment. It's a way to bring folks together. You think about on a Saturday morning, 50, 80,000 people, depending on the institution, are screaming, yelling, cheering for their team, hoping that they get an outcome that they want, right? And you don't say our team won. You say we won, because that's the closeness, that's the bond that you have when there's an affiliation with your team. So absolutely. Anything else that, there's one thing that I know is a big deal that we've been talking about often when it comes to college athletics. Laura? <laughs> I drive, he, oh, well, I didn't drive, I, I, I was on a flight, um, and I had my laptop out, and typically I get, hey, what, what are you doing, where are you headed, and I shared with them, I'm, I'm going to, to give a presentation at Davis on college athletics. First thing I hear, and this is like consistent on every flight, do you think athletes should be paid, right? Do you think athletes should be paid? Am I... Rehearsed line is always, well, athletes are already being paid. They're just not fairly compensated for their labor, right? And so when I think about headlines today, we're 
constantly talking about the increasing commercialization of athletes. How are athletes coexisting in a multi-million dollar industry, right? How are they able to strike a healthy balance between their academics and athletics? That, that is the fundamental question that we're up against, to figure out how athletes are kind of navigating a space where the commercialism, the uh, pursuit of winning, uh, tends to supersede their academic goals and obligations. But in hearing my conversations with the athletic stakeholders here, you all have been able to manage that. And I appreciate the conversations to show that there are models that exist that are trying to strike that healthy balance between academics and athletics. So I'd be remiss if I didn't talk a little bit about the role that sport has played in my life and how that has enabled me to really think about some of the most critical issues um, in college sports. And John, the famous uh, UCLA basketball coach, John Wooden, um, he really had an affinity for Miguel de Cervantes. Um, he was a poet, a Spanish poet, in the mid 16th century. And a quote from John Wood, he says, Cervantes said the journey is better than the end. Practices to me were the journey. So he spent a, a lot of time immersing himself in that journey and to a lesser degree thinking about results and outcomes. And as I moved through this journey, um, and my father was, played an integral role in that journey um, as my little league coach and coached me all the way up to high school. And there's a picture of myself and, and my younger brother um, in our Little League jerseys. By the way, we went 32-0 uh, over, two, over two seasons. And then below is a picture of my, uh, me and my, my, my six-year-old, who will be seven next, next week. Uh, but I've you know, obviously been in his um, life, and I'm really thinking about you know, um, some of the, the wisdom um, the, 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 the educational moments that I had with my dad. And I'll fast forward to my junior year in high school. And I was fortunate uh, to have a number of athletic scholarship offers for baseball and to a lesser degree for basketball. And I remember my dad walking into my room and I was 16. And he said, son. So, so anytime my dad started off with son, um, he thought he was going to say something profound. Um, or either he forgot my name, <laughs> e <laughs> even though I was named after my dad. Um, and, and he said, son, um, you know that there's a professor, a sociologist at Berkeley who said that any black parent that sends their kid to Berkeley on an athletic scholarship should be tried for child abuse. I said, like, whoa, 16, that's heavy. I had to process that. But, you know, my dad was good at helping me to kind of read the world on my own terms. And he said that, you know, there's a number of black athletes who are entering Cal they are recruited for their athletic prowess, but they're not investing the time and energy into their academic pursuit. Many aren't graduating. So they're in an exploitive structural arrangement. It's like, all right. He didn't say it in those terms. Uh, I said, okay. But of course, I didn't listen to my dad and I went on to Berkeley. Um, but understanding what was at stake, understanding what was at stake there, right? And of course, if any of you have followed Berkeley um, and the work in the Bay Area of Dr. Harry Edwards. Dr. Harry Edwards was the mouthpiece behind the 1968 Mexico City Olympic Games with John Carlos and Tommy Smith. They had the black gloves on, the clenched fist. Uh, this was all about human rights. Uh, it never really materialized, but he did orchestrate um, that spectacle, that moment 
that's certainly um, been part of our history. And sure enough, within one semester at Berkeley, um, I was already connected to Dr. Harry Edwards. Um, to this day, I consider him a mentor, a friend, um, who helped me kind of navigate this space as someone who was coming into an environment that wasn't as supportive as it could be. Um, so much so, uh, here's, here's, here's uh, my uh, baseball team at, at Cal. Surprisingly, the number of um, African Americans on our team at the time at a, at a Division I baseball team. But you see the previous picture with our clenched fist and today. So we were really starting to read the world on our terms and to really think about how do we navigate this space. And I'd be I'm happy to say that um, all of us, but maybe number four, have been successful um, at what we do. Um, and so this is a group that, that certainly um, um, helped push me, my thinking uh, when it came to, to, to college athletics. And so um, kind of fast forwarding here uh, real quick, as I think about uh, my own work and how I was able to go from a college student athlete to now thinking about education, I study students, particularly our most underserved students, um, how they are engaging on campus, what are the conditions in which you know, they're able to engage, whether it's a campus climate, right? Like, how does that impact or impede their ability to have some level of success? But at the heart of all this is um, centering equity, right, and intersectional inclusion in the kind of work I'm doing, and also looking at policy as a parameter uh, for inclusion or exclusion, uh, whether it has to do with, you know, uh, AB 206, um, um, which was a policy in California that enabled athletes to monetize their name, image, and likeness. As you know, in July 1 of 2021, uh, the NCAA member institutions came up with a policy that now allows athletes uh, to monetize their name, image, and likeness. So California doesn't have to be um, the state um, that, that might advance this policy uh, but they understood that if we're going to be equitable, we have to make sure that all states have access to this. And so um, it's been an important development that you've seen because now conversations around NIL have been um, continue to increase. And now we're thinking about, you know, how does uh, NIL affect the recruiting? Are we now allowing boosters to decide what schools that, that athletes are actually uh, attending at this point? And so with that sort of context, um, I'd like to move into to really thinking about um, the heart of the issues that I think matter uh, when it comes to college athletics. Um, as we all know, I don't want to assume that everyone has a sense of, of the athletics and the infrastructure, but the NCAA is the governing body of college athletics. And when we think about uh, college athletics, there is this, these amateurism ideals. Um, and it was borrowed from the 19th century British model that says that we're gonna play sport. The aristocrats, the establishment said that we're gonna play sport just for the purity of it, right? For the intrinsic rewards. So imagine the establishment telling the working class that, hey, you're not gonna get paid to play in sport. Uh, we just wanna play uh, for the joy, for the happiness. And the irony of what we see now in college sports where those who engage in the rule making are the ones who benefit um, and reap the benefits from that arrangement on the backs of those athletes. Um, so we consider sport an avocation, simply a hobby, right? Even in a multi-billion dollar industry uh, of college sports. And we do see a disproportionate number of white stakeholders, coaches, athletic directors, commissioners, who are reaping the benefits from this athletic uh, enterprise. A little bit more context uh, on the amateurism front. Again, it's a, a tax-exempt status. Um, the NCAA has generated large sums of money, largely from its television contracts. Uh, 14 years, $10.8 billion in agreement with U.S. Uh, CBS and Time Warner Sports. Um, in 2017, fiscal year, they've ex they exceeded $1 billion in revenue. Not too bad, huh? 
Nick Saban, one of the highest paid coaches uh, in college sports, around $11 million a year, a little less than what I'm making uh, as a college professor. And then, of course, when you think about there's, there's probably a handful of Division I schools that actually, 20, 21, 22 schools that actually make money or generate revenue. Uh, University of Oregon, uh, $391 million in revenue, a lot of that coming from uh, the owner of Nike, Phil Knight, um, and, and his donations. But as we think about college athletes, how are they situated within this current enterprise? Uh, they are still less protected, um, particularly in those revenue generating sports. We also know that athletes spend more than 50 hours a week on sport-related activities. And that's not to mention the mental fatigue, the physical exhaustion, the nagging injuries that accompany those who participate in sport. 50 hours a week. Does anyone know what is required for athletes? 20, 20 hours a week. But we're saying it's doubled. And so, as much as I think about this current structural arrangement, the question we must ask, are they being fairly compensated? Are athletes being educationally reimbursed, right? Medically, financially. And I like to frame athletes as captive. Too often they're unfree. They're confined to certain, due to you know, control and hyper surveillance mechanism. For example, athletes sign a national letter of intent with their participating university. The terms are non-negotiable. Either you accept the conditions or you reject it and you don't go to that school. That's what they call a contract of adhesion. Right? Is that fair? That you can't negotiate the terms of a contract. If the university says either you sign this or you don't play, they don't have any control say in what they're actually signing. We also have the one year renewable scholarship, which means that for any reason, a coach cannot renew a scholarship. It rarely happens, and if it does happen, the athlete can appeal it, and typically it's a favorable position. But if you have a scholarship taken away, why would you want to go back to a team? You'll likely become a student and not an athlete unless you transfer to another school. Another mechanism that's used for control is major clustering. Um, I was talking about this earlier. How do we ensure that athletes are majoring things that are aligned with their career trajectory, right? Are athletes being steered or channeled into majors of least resistance or majors that don't align um, with their future careers? So major clustering is when you have 25% or more of athletes, same team and the same major, which is very common. And then attendance monitoring. Uh, some schools, particularly in our Power Five conferences, have hired class checkers simply to walk around campus to ensure that athletes are in class. A form of surveillance, right? A controlling mechanism, right? And oftentimes it's framed as actually caring for the athlete, right? That because we have um, all sorts of um, attendance monitoring practices, uh, because we have study table that you're required to sign in and sign out of, that shows that we care. We care about your future. But I also see this as an impediment um, for athletes to really think about being independent, right? And being able to make mistakes and learn from those mistakes. So these are ways in which, you know, um, some might call it um, a carceral system. Um, that has built-in uh, surveillance mechanisms to control players and keep them 
you know, having docile bodies, right? This is something um, that has become problematic. Um, I've even, um, in my, my latest book I have coming out, we're now starting to build state-of-the-art facilities um, that are very plush with, you know, uh, uh, you know plush seatings. Um, you've got barber shops. You've got swimming pools. Um, you've got golf courses. All sorts of amenities uh, for athletes. And I'm asking myself, why would you want to leave this facility? And oftentimes they're built outside of the academic core, on the periphery of campus, which makes it harder for athletes to, to engage in the broader academic community because it's so taxing for them to walk back and forth from facility to the academic core. Is this a form of control or surveillance on the athletes? And so, and so one way as we think about college sports, the increasing commercialization, we think about sort of the mechanisms that are sort of built in uh, that oftentimes lead to athletes really thinking about, do I have control over my journey? Um, college stakeholders have put forth reform efforts. And I mentioned the state-of-the-art facilities. But we've also had what we call academic progress rate, which was about eligibility and retention. Unfortunately, through APR, there's been a disproportionate number of HBCU athletes that have been penalized, our least resource schools through APR. Um, the argument has been that you can actually game the system if you have resources when it comes to APR. Those less resource schools are less likely to, to be able to game the system and they're oftentimes penalized uh, for their work. Um, you also mentioned uh, the 20 hour a week rule. You also uh, talk about the unlimited meal plan for athletes. Um, do you all have unlimited plans here? No? Um, and then we also have the 2016 pledge and commitment to promoting racial and gender uh, equity. You know, these are reform efforts that were put in place to ensure that athletes are striking a healthy balance between their academics and athletics. But it's important as we think about this messaging here. How many of you all have watched March Madness? There's commercials that, that show up um, frequently. There are over 400,000 NCAA student athletes, and most of us will go pro in something other than sport. Y'all believe that? Of course. They'll go pro in something other than sport. One of the problems I have with this messaging campaign is that the NCAA and member schools generate a, a lot of money to put forth this messaging and, and campaign, right? This money is generated on the backs of these athletes, right? But if we were to disaggregate the experiences and outcomes of athletes by race and sport, not everybody is going pro in something other than sport. So they're using their own exploitive arrangement to message against them something that is actually inaccurate. Because when we think about going pro in something other than sport, we're thinking about going pro in something meaningful post-college. One of the ways you go pro in something meaningful post-college is that you are positioned during college with internships, with high-impact activity that's going to position you well for life after sport, right? You've got to be able to ask yourself, when the music stops playing, am I positioned for professional or graduate school? Am I po positioned for a good playing job? And many athletes cannot say yes. Given the demands on their time, um, I was just talking to some athletes today. It's difficult to engage in internships during the season. It's difficult, right, to really position ourselves for life after sport, 
given all the things that we have to juggle. So we must ask the right questions. Um, I'll be the first to say, I benefited from college athletics. I think I was a decent student. I was a pretty good student. I'm not sure I would be at Cal if I couldn't swing a bat and run fast. I'm not sure. I don't know. So I've benefited from this arrangement. But I also know that we can improve this arrangement. You know, how can stakeholders in the affairs of athletics devise a more equitable system for vulnerable athletes? How does the structural arrangement of the athletic enterprise affect outcomes for athletes, particularly high-profile black athletes? And I mentioned from the start that as much good as we see in college athletics, there are certain outcomes that have not changed. And if we're centering race, if we're centering equity in our discussions, in our research, um, the outcomes are pretty clear. And they're pretty discouraging. Division I black men and women college athletes continue to protest inequitable racialized experience and hostile campus racial climates. So thinking about racial microaggressions, um, thinking about the interactions that they're having with their peers within the broader community. Um, it's been well documented um, that, that black athletes, as compared to their non-black uh, counterparts, are experiencing really hostile campus racial climates. I talked about the surveillance mechanisms. Black athletes are more intensely surveilled on their own campuses than their, their counterparts. And then one of the biggest outcomes that we use that I think there's a lot of ambiguity in graduation rates, particularly if we're not thinking about what's going on within the campus experience, they continue to lag when it comes to graduation rates, hovering right around 54%. Another area that's received a lot of attention over the last three decades is the underrepresentation of coaches and senior level administrators. More than 80% of coaches are white. In revenue sports, more than 60% of athletes are black. What message does that send to athletes when they don't see senior level administrators and coaches who look like them. It can create an unhealthy, unwelcoming, isolating environment for them. And then as I mentioned before, the academic progress rate. They account for the vast majority of schools that are penalized for low APRs, despite only constituting roughly 6% of all NCAA Division I institutions. And so as much as I want to say that the system will one day improve, that it will get better, that as long as we just be patient, it would get better, I don't think I'm of that camp. Because um, I would say over the last six decades, these numbers and outcomes have not changed. Um, the NCAA member schools do a great job of of tinkering with the edges, giving athletes unlimited meal plans, um, devising the APR to suggest that we're moving toward matriculation and graduation for all athletes. The messaging, more than 400,000 athletes are going pro in something other than sport, right? These, this, the messaging campaign is brilliant. The work that they've done is brilliant, but it gives us the illusion of change, but we never, address the core issues, the deep structural inequities that exist within college athletics. Um, here's another picture here. Um, I've never tried it. Uh, mayo chuck, uh, a combination of mayonnaise and ketchup. It's just repackaged to give you illusion that this is something brand new. 
And that's the argument that I'm making here with college athletics is that we've just repackaged things uh, to give the sense that we're moving in the right direction. But if we look at those outcome patterns, not much has changed. And the system, given all that we say athletes can benefit from, the current conditions, based on those outcomes, um, it's irreconcilable. And I don't believe that there's, no, there's a restorative solution. Um, we can say, well, let's just hire more black coaches and administrators. Let's just improve their graduation rates. Well, how are we going to do that? when they're spending 50 plus hours a week on sport related activities. Um, and I would love to see something else that has yet to be defined. When we're able to acknowledge that the current conditions cannot be restored, And there isn't any solution. I think we're better off as athletic stakeholders to really engage in practices that will lead to healing and creating a better environment for our most vulnerable athletes on campus. You know, um, I hear the argument about the racialization of time, that just over time things are going to get better. I haven't seen it. Um, I remember Dr. Harry Edwards, when, when I was at Berkeley, would talk about he said, I've been saying the same issues in the 1970s. No one listened to me. Now I'm saying the same issues today, and people are starting to listen to me. Um, and I'm not saying we give up on the system and throw in the proverbial towel. What I'm suggesting is that we continue to fight uh, to disrupt structures, but also be mindful that, that these athletes are suffering. And there are things that we could do today to create a better environment for these athletes. And so um, I want to spend uh, a few minutes uh, really talking about um, what, what might be a way that create, can create a more humanizing environment for our most vulnerable athletes, um, a safe space for healing, um, because often the questions um, have been raised about whether athletes are being educationally reimbursed. So the first thing, as a researcher, um, I'd love to do a better job of collecting data that helps us to respond meaningfully um, and optimize our decision making. Um, most schools, unfortunately, do not have a data monitoring strategy to really think about how do we disaggregate that work and then look at those interaction patterns that exist on campus that will lead to better outcomes because we have an understanding of the current uh, structural arrangement. I would love to see the NCAA and member institutions reduce credit hours and develop a degree completion program. So within season, um, you might have to take 12 hours. Um, I would love to see athletes um, taking less courses. But, but if you're taking less courses, it's going to take longer uh, time for degree. Um, if, that's a, if that's a concern, let's ensure that we have money set aside to support those athletes in years five, year six, year seven, um, if it takes that long. But I would love to see a reduction in, in the credit hours. Um, I also kind of alluded to this earlier about member institutions should reconsider, redefine the national letter of intent. Um, we need more accountability mechanisms. So if, if, if the, the national letter of intent is an, a, a contract of adhesion, let's redefine that and include conditions and terms that put the accountability on coaches and other stakeholders to ensure, for example, that athletes are engaged in high impact activities. Right, and if they are not engaged and it doesn't produce certain outcomes, there's some accountability 
on the part of those stakeholders. I would love to see that happen. But right now, it's just you sign the, greet, uh, you sign the letter, um, you're, you're with the university at least one year, um, and then if you'd like to transfer, you know, there's a year of residency. Schools should, should enforce the 20-hour rule. Um, if you have spent any time in athletics, you know that that rule is not being enforced. They are spending way more than 20 hours a week uh, on sport-related activities. Something that um, just with this, this past week I just read, um, how an athlete committed suicide. Um, happens more frequent than I could imagine. Uh, the NCAA goals data reported that more than 30% of athletes have reported mental health issues. Um, that number is likely higher uh, for those that go unreported because the stigma that's attached to, to mental health. Um, but I'm thinking about ways that if we're going to humanize the situation, if we're going to create a space, uh, understanding that this structural arrangement is irreconcilable, how do we at least create a more supportive and less marginalizing and alienating environment for these athletes? First and foremost, as a governing body, enforce mandatory health and safety standards. At present, the NCAA puts the onus on member institutions to decide on their health and safety standards. The NCAA rules on everything else having to do with college athletics, but when it comes to health and safety, they're nowhere to be seen. So if we can start with universal policy, where the NCAA is actually enforcing health and safety standards. I've also think about how students, particularly our vulnerable students, develop and utilize informal support networks. Um, it's been well documented. Uh, our vulnerable athletes, particularly our students, particularly our black uh, students, don't take advantage of traditional campus resources like mental health facility. Why? There's a disconnect. There's, there's, there are trust issues, right? There are not open lines of communication. So oftentimes black students see each other as a resource or they may go off campus and talk to a sibling, uh, a family member, a mentor, a, a high school coach when it comes to uh, concerns that they have. Even when it comes to academic concerns, uh, they're less likely to go to the writing center. They're less likely to take advantage of, 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 of grad success programs. Um, for reasons, given the history of exclusion uh, in this country on, on, on campuses, uh, they're le less likely to pursue these traditional avenues, right? So informal support networks have worked um, for these students, for our most vulnerable students. So how do we create mechanisms uh, or lines of communications where universities can connect with non-dominant communities, where, where universities connect with, you know, family? So we broaden the way in which we think about community, right? Uh, rather than simply thinking about the university as a whole as their only, as the one-stop shop, the only place where athletes can um, um, engage with, 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 you know, counselors and, and other support systems. Representation uh, is always important, uh, similar to, you know, coaches, the gross underrepresentation of coaches and administrators. Can we have more counselors, support systems, student affairs professionals that actually look like these students? I think it can go a long ways in terms of uh, creating a culture where students feel um, as if they are actually part um, uh, and showing a capacity to actually love these students back. And uh, the final point uh, when it comes to mental health is, is really establishing a system, independent, equity-driven experts routinely evaluate every aspect of care that schools deliver to students. 
when we think about Power, power Five schools, um, you were at LSU at one point, football, they could have 25 plus coaches that are hired serving as football coaches. That's a lot of money. So the argument that there's not enough money to hire folks to think about uh, monitoring the aspects, the services that are offered to athletes and ensuring that they're delivered in an equitable way depends on the will. And to a lesser degree, it depends on, you know, having the finances to actually carry this or execute this plan. It has to be a priority. It has to be important. And then going back to the uh, coaches and administrators, um, again, having a data monitoring pro uh, policy is important when it comes to recruitment, hiring, promotion outcomes by racial demographic groups. Um, we, we should also think about, and this is similar to the Rooney Rule and the West Coast Conference also came up with the, some hiring practices, but really thinking about who is actually getting access to these opportunities. And it starts early on during that hiring, during the interview process to ensure that we have viable candidates, qualified candidates who are getting access to interviews. Um, I would love to see um, more incentives and disincentives for the hiring of, 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 of stakeholders of color in head coaching and senior level positions. Um, how do we ensure that we create a culture where um, uh, coaches of color and senior level administrators feel like um, they have a shot at, at one of these positions? And lastly, uh, there's been some data that shows that um, as you go through the pipeline, the hiring pipeline, um, candidates are typically drawn from that, that senior class, that senior administrative class. So how do we create a pipeline of more um, coaches that are assistant coaches that might be associate athletic directors um, moving through that pipeline? And that, in addition to ensuring that viable candidates are serving in the in the, in, the, in the associate, um, in, in the athletic director role, or even conference commissioners, um, or even you know, SWA, uh, senior women administrator roles, how do we ensure that we have a pipeline of those coming in? Because they are qualified candidates right now for these positions, but we want to ensure that, that they are represented across, um, and even uh, at the lower levels. So with that, uh, for those who are really thinking about working closely with athletes, just some questions to consider. Is there a need to ensure transparency and guarantees regarding key protections such as high impact educational activities in the documents that recruits sign? This goes back to the national letter of intent. Are there key protections for athletes? Um, are those terms and conditions negoti negotiable? And are there high impact educational activities that can make the stakeholders more accountable when it comes to the experiences and ultimately um, the desirable outcomes of these athletes. Um, in what ways can colleges and universities strike a healthy balance between academics and athletics? Which is a broader question um, that we must think about. And then lastly, how do we know that athletes are learning and developing as students? We kind of get a sense of these, the athletic prowess of athletes and what they're capable of doing on the field or the court. But how do we ensure and how do we know that athletes are learning and developing as students? And again, talking to, to Laura, talking to, to Mike, talking to others, um, there are models that exist um, that, that are really tracking uh, their experiences as well as their outcomes. Um, and with that, uh, I thank you uh, for listening, uh, for being here today. Stay up here, buddy.
<laughs> I'm, a, I'm a walker. I'm a walker. <laughs> uh, for a question, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to take sure. the liberty, given the, the crowd here uh, is, is a combination of my athletics friends and my academic colleagues, uh, to ask you, um, do you think this is primarily a, a power five, the elite uh, institutions in terms of the top end of the distribution of, of, of athletics, the, the issues you uh, just talked about? Or is this, and is it in, within that, do you think it's primarily you know, a, a handful of sports? Uh, or do you think it's the, the entire system, uh, you know, all the way down to division three and uh, in all our sports in athletics? Yes. <laughs> um, yes, I, I, would, I would say that, that it's largely your Power Five conferences uh, where there's an arms race to the top. And, and winning, uh, securing corporate sponsorship are priority uh, as compared to thinking about the academic goals and, and ensuring that athletes are well positioned uh, once the music stops playing. I had an opportunity uh, to talk to a, a group of Division Three athletes their mindset, um, they still want to win. They still want to be elite athletes. They still want to focus on their craft. They spend a lot of time uh, devoted to their sport, but they're also thinking about like, there's a chance that I can win, um, but is there a chance that I can go pro? So how do I think about internship possibilities? How do I think about uh, positioning myself for life after sport? And so the, the mindset, the culture, uh, at a division three or division school tend to be different in terms of, 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 of the experiences that they have in, uh, during college. So, so absolutely, I think much of what we see playing out is within our power, power five conferences and largely within our revenue generating sports. Although, that, although it's largely within revenue generating sports, it does triple, trickle down to Olympic sports because those athletes also have a sense of there's an opportunity to play professional sports. So therefore, um, I'm also going to buy into this culture of winning and to a lesser degree um, about you know, my academic outcomes. Anyone in the, in the live crowd uh, have a question? McCall? Um, right, so, so people want so. <laughs> to ask a naive question, because athletics is one area of higher ed I really don't study at all. So my impression. Um, is that actually there were more supports for athletes than others. I think about over the years, the students I have who are having to work full time or other and time management related issues, that my student athletes actually had more structure and um, you know, a, le a note from a coach, um, a kind of extra time, you know, more flexibility or more kind of protections, if you will, than students coming into the university without that structure. Not to take anything away from everything you said, but I just, if anything, I've always looked to athletics as a way to increase additional supports, similar kind of peer and climate experiences for the non-athletes at many universities. So I'm just, I'm, you're giving me a kind of a very different take on it. I would just love your kind of reflection on that. Yes, uh, so I started off with a quote from John Wooden. Toward the latter part of this, I'm going to, come up with another quote from John Wooden. He said, don't mistake activity for productivity. And universities, particularly athletic departments, are very good about making a compelling case for showering athletes with a whole bunch of stuff, but how meaningful is that stuff, right? And so when I was mentioning UC Davis and their model of looking at academic outcomes of athletes or life after sport, um, I was serious when I said there are not many universities that actually have a model that are thinking about that. So you can have all the study groups you want, you can have all of the study tables you want, you can have the one-on-one -on -one tutors, you can have the writing centers, all of that. But if you're not assessing the effectiveness of those resources, how can you make a case that they're actually effective, that they're actually working. And so I, I, I agree that when you look at the athlete and their non-athlete peers, they definitely have a structure. And that structure is framed that we care about you. Look at the 100 plus computers that we have in our lab. Look at the one-on-one -on -one tutoring you have access to. But again, think about this structural arrangement. 50 plus hours on sport-related activities, 
um, there was the, some goal study that showed that um, during season, basketball, men's and women's basketball players missed like two classes a week because of their sport. So yes, you can still get tutoring, but if you're, you know, so distant from the academic world because you're consumed with sport, it makes it difficult for you to say, these resources, these programs are actually working. So yes, um, I'd be the first to tell you that you go to LSU, you go to Oregon, you look at all their facilities, they're plush. They have everything you need. Uh, but, but I don't think it translates. Hey, Mary? Um, so first of all, thank you so much for a great talk. And um, it wasn't at all the focus of your talk, but I'd love to hear your thoughts and insights on it, that there's another aspect of vulnerability for our athletes that have shown through in multiple cases of USC, Penn State, elsewhere, where there's been vulnerability, sexual abuse, other types of abuse by coaches, trainers, and others in some cases going on for decades and very horrific. Um, how could we improve and so those kinds of situations don't occur again in the future? Absolutely, um, and uh, certainly a, a, a critical issue um, within college athletic is that uh, culture of complicity, uh, a culture or, 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 or an establishment that's too big to fail. And we saw that at Penn State, we saw that at Michigan State, uh, we saw that at North Carolina. And you know, one way to kind of curb uh, that unscrupulous behaviors is, is to really, um, you know, I, I, th I think it's multifaceted, but, but do a better job of reporting mechanisms where, where the voices of athletes are being heard, um, that there's no retaliation uh, for reporting, um, you know, uh, behaviors of coaches, behaviors of trainers, um, behaviors of others who serve in, in, in authoritative roles. And so I think that is one thing we learned from the Penn State case is that transparency, um, reporting mechanisms, irrespective of, of who's in charge, to ensure that there's accountability uh, across the board. I don't think we saw that at Penn State. We, we, we certainly didn't see that at Michigan State. And um, new policies that have been developed and enacted are really taking a close look at reporting patterns and, and, and ways in which we can include mechanisms that allow athletes to be able to report these. And there are actually consequences and accountability uh, for not engaging in, in practices that they think are um, part of the values and mission of the university. I think you, in, in your talk, mentioned the NCAA does not regulate it, these health and welfare. Correct, correct. So there's a lot of academic regulations, yeah. but there's very little regulations on, on student conduct, right, and that's right. left yeah. up to the university. Correct. So how would you fix that 50 hours a week? Because on the books it says 20, but for playing time, you have to show that you're there at practice when there is no practice. You're there after hours. I mean, there's cameras around. They know when people are using the facilities when they're not. And so people do get rewarded for showing that extra effort and commitment and that they're a competitor. So how would you ever get around that? I mean, even when they're not in season, they're doing that. So is there a solution? I don't, I don't know what it is, because these are all students who you know, they, they spent their lives probably from four or five, six years of age being identified as being good at sport. This is so core to their identity that their, their competitors are going to want to do this. So some of it's on the athlete's shoulder themselves. They're pushing themselves to do this because they want to compete. But how can we possibly control that? So, so there's, 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 there's two things to think about here. Um, it's athletes volunteering and spending extra time on their own uh, to get better at their craft. But there's also those in position of authority, coaches, that are mandating extra film sessions, extra workouts, extra practices, right? So again, this goes back to, 
issues around mental health, issues around abuse of athletes, having reporting mechanisms. Um, as much as a baseball player, a basketball player would love the additional work to get better at their craft because they want to move to the next level, um, you, as a player, you're not going to go to a coach and say, hey, we're at 22 hours. We, we got to shut it down, right? You're not going to do that. Why? Because you, your scholarship probably would be non-renewed the following year. You'd probably get less playing time. You would be considered someone who is not part of the team chemistry and likely would be dismissed at some point. And you'd probably be treat, treated in some way that you probably don't want to come back to the team after. So I, again, there has to be a non anonymous reporting mechanism in place where, um, you know, I, I've I've been on a number of cases with athletes where they report to me, like, the coach is abusive. I have shin splints and they're still making me run two miles, right? I'm hurt, but the coach says, suck it up because they have a culture of masculinity. Um, and they feel like it's, it shows grit to play hurt, right? It shows that the, a, a certain level of toughness that you're playing hurt, right? And so as a player, as a vulnerable athlete, you're not going to go to coach and say, hey, we've got to cut it. We're at 20. I'm, I'm, I'm headed home now. I'm headed to work on a research project with McCall Curlander. Now, it's not, it's not going to happen, right? Uh, and so we have to have those anonymous reporting mechanisms. For our most vulnerable athletes who might be dealing with mental health issues, who might be dealing with the team dynamics or the team culture, they have to have reporting mechanisms. And then someone has to respond meaningfully to those requests. It can't be swept under the rug because that creates a more toxic environment. So if you're going to be a major player, you have to be part of the system. You can't be excluded. Your voices have to be heard. Uh, your experiences have to matter. You have to be valued. You have to be seen as human, right? There's a human element to it. You can't be seen as subhuman or inferior to others. And I think that's, that's where we start to matter, that these aren't athletes that we can exploit. And then once their eligibility is up, we don't know where they go. We have to treat them like we want to be treated. We have to see them as human. We have to see them as valuable, valued part uh, of that, this entire enterprise. And I think that's, that, to me, is, is, is fundamental. So I'm going to put our athletic staff on the spot. And from your perspective, what you've heard today, uh, you know, what comes to mind? Yeah. <laughs> I hand the mic over because we've heard from the academics. So. Um, so I don't necessarily have a question per se, but so I work in athletics. I'm a former student athlete as well. But the first thing that kind of comes to mind for me, or is more of a question, is is the expectation that we have on athletics unreasonable when we're not asking the same questions of campus? So on main campuses, black students in general are graduating at lower rates than their white counterparts, same thing as athletics. Um, I had one black professor in undergrad, like we don't have representation in professors. So a lot of, and definitely not disagreeing with anything that you're saying, but in trying to think about how we reform a system when it's sitting within a system that has the exact same problems. Um, I struggle with and um, it feels like a little bit part missing of the conversation and so trying to find more black administrators would be great but looking at campus leadership who also is not representative of the student body that they're serving still collecting tuition dollars. Um, I'm just not really sure how we reconcile those. Um, and living in that fishbowl, student athletes do have more resources closer in their network due to the fact that athletics departments understand that they have to provide it because they're taking up so much of student athletes' time. Um, but at the same time, Black, being a black student on a campus where the mental health professionals are white and they're not going to get it. And so that doesn't really change whether I'm a student athlete or a regular student. So this isn't really a question, 
so that maybe has a direct answer, but kind of thinking how it really all ties together and how sometimes in college athletics we like to pretend that we're still not living in the United States and that all of the same issues in real life are still represented in our college athletics departments in a fishbowl. So that's just the whole time I was just kind of like, I don't know, not really sure what to do, but I appreciated everything that you shared today. And yeah. Thank you, thank you. I'll, I'll, I'll say two things. One, sport inevitably uh, reflects society, right? So what we see happening in college sports in that sort of small area we see reflective of, of the broader institution, right? Um, and then two, um, I study higher education. So that informs a lot of how I think about college athletics. So absolutely, when we see uh, underrepresentation of faculty and staff and not being reflective of the student body, um, that's important. But we also see that happening in, in college athletics. And I, I, I'm trying to raise critical awareness that as much as you want to talk and celebrate uh, college athletics on Saturdays, uh, and even March Madness, all the hype around that, there's some underlying equity issues justice issues that we need to put to the forefront. And until we start to have those same campaigns and commercials that we have about those 400,000 athletes going pro and something else, it's clearly not as much of a priority um, to the, and I'm trying to bring it to light. I'm trying to bring it to light. I'm not on those commercials. Um, you know, you got corporations spending uh, a million and a half dollars for two minutes of a commercial. Um, Unfortunately, we're not talking about racial equity or racial justice in a, many of those commercials. Maybe, maybe in the first couple of weeks in the aftermath of George Floyd, but since then, it was, it's been all performative. So is it the issue the NCAA or is it campus? Well, well they're, they're tied, right? Like, there's, the, the, there's no NCAA that's like the big bad monster. They're, they're tied. It's the NCAA and member institutions. Member institutions make up the rules. They're a part of that, right? So, you know, NCAA is housed in Indianapolis, but member institutions are the ones who uh, engage in the rulemaking process. So it's, 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 it's everyone. Uh, it's all stakeholders involved. So I want to just follow up. I, I think you make a really excellent point that I really appreciate. Uh, uh, in my work here at UC Davis, I study higher education, college access, and persistence. And so I, uh, we looked at within athletics at UC Davis, and there are disparities in graduation rates among um, students who are underrepresented and those who aren't. And what we then looked at within athletics, and, and black and, and Latinx students who are athletes actually graduate at a higher rate uh, than their non-athlete counterparts. So one of the things that you know we could do, or one of the things that in athletics that are helping students graduate. There's things that help them, there's things that hurt them. Yeah. And you try to find the right mix, but some of those things we've learned in athletics could actually be carried forward to the non-student athletes to help increase graduation rates um, within the university. Yeah. Things like uh, summer school when you fall behind in credits, I think mandatory progress towards degree, I think is something that really helps student athletes. If I wanna be eligible, I need to stay you know, on track towards my degree and then athletics has funds to then fund summer school. That's, that's something that could help non-student athletes in terms of keeping them on track towards degree, just for example. We have a question online. Yeah, we have a couple questions from our Zoom audience. Um, Jonathan asks, has the COVID pandemic made these inequities worse? And if so, how can we develop policies that prevent emergencies from placing undue burdens on some groups over others? Yeah, there's, there's, there's a good amount of evidence that, that the pandemic uh, certainly uh, um, illuminates a lot of these inequities that already exist. Um, I'm not sure when it comes to the athlete how the, the, the pandemic has impacted. We clearly know that um, our, our most vulnerable families uh, are impacted first and worst uh, when it came to the pandemic, less likely to have health access to health care, more underlying conditions. 
Um, and so I do see, um, particularly depending on um, uh, this, this, this sort of uh, income hierarchy, um, how some athletes and families might be affected um, um, by, by the pandemic. Uh, but I, but I, haven't, I haven't studied and, and, and heard much, of, specifically with, when it comes to athletes, how they've been affected. I mean, um, I'm assuming that the case would be no different than their non-athlete peers, depending on um, the level of support um, that they may have in their family. Um, athletes, when it comes to, you know, virtual spaces, um, athletic departments have actually done a pretty good job of ensuring that athletes have access to resources uh, to ensure that they're able to, uh, to perform well uh, in a virtual space. But, um, um, you know, I'm, I'm not sure where you're going with the question, um, but, but um, is there something else they might want to expand on here when it comes to the pandemic? Um, he said surveillance of athletes increased massively with the pandemic, and that might have made things worse. Well, I would say with all athletes, all athletes, all students as well, um, there is some level of surveillance when, when you're in the virtual space. So, yeah, yeah, I guess I'll, I'll leave it there. And another Zoom attendee, Darnell, asks, are there any successful examples of more equitable student athlete experiences in other countries that the US can look to as an example? And if not, is that used as an excuse to not improve the US student athlete experience? Um, who, who, who's that? Who posted that question? Darnell, I'm, 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 gonna, I'm gonna cop out here and say, I would love if, if, if you're doing research in that area, if there are other countries, other models that, uh, successful models that exist, I would love to see that. Um, again, uh, not just because I'm here at UC Davis, but again, I had a chance to look through the work that they've been doing on the website, and now I've had a conversation. Uh, I do like this model. I, I told Laura they should be uh, out there campaigning on a tour, uh, selling and sharing um, their resources, sharing uh, their ideas. Uh, and the work that they've been doing in this area. Um, I, I also would, would give a shout out to, to Vanderbilt. Uh, several years ago, I had an opportunity um, to talk with David Williams. He has since uh, passed away. Uh, but they also had a model uh, where they were, uh, athletes were required uh, to do study abroad, uh, as well as internships uh, during their off seasons. Uh, and they were able to see um, how athletes were expand the ways they so, sort of read the world um, and also expand, um, you know, other possibilities beyond sport. Um, I can't say that it was assessed to see the effectiveness of those high impact activities, but that was the only other model. Um, I would have to venture out to Division II, Division three schools to really get a sense of like, this is a model that I can support and get behind because there was a, a healthy balance between um, their academic and athletic identities. Any other questions? Are there any more online? Um, yeah. Yes. Um, so Mia asks, as high school kids approach the college recruitment process, what kinds of questions should student athletes and their parents ask college recruiters to assess level of support and awareness about the needs and challenges of vulnerable student athletes? That is a beautiful question, Mia. Um, I would love to see more nonprofit organizations, support groups that are connecting with student athletes pre-college and talking about their rights. Uh, talking about well-being before they get to the university, talking about the National Letter of Intent, talking about NIL, right, and exposures to the recruitment process, uh, thinking about high-impact activities and how they should be positioning themselves once they enter the university, asking the right questions to their coaches, to their advisors, and not relying on their advisors and coaches Right, to carry them to the finish line. Uh, so asking the questions, maybe you connect with a mentor 
your high school football coach or your basketball coach or your track coach or your volleyball coach and say, hey, coach, you know, what are some of the questions I should be asking my coach or faculty members during my campus visit? So the work has to happen before they arrive to the university. And I haven't seen many organizations that exist that are really thinking about how athletes can expand their knowledge base before they get to college. Because oftentimes, they become more vulnerable because they're at the liberty of their coach or their advisors or other stakeholders, and they're not really sure, particularly our first generation college students, right? And so if, if there are ways that you know, preparatory programs pre-college are um, raising awareness around key issues that they would have to wrestle with once they got to the university, I, I think that would go a long ways in terms of creating a, a better, uh, fairer opportunity for, for, for these students who participate in athletics. One more question. Um, it is a little more broad. Um, Warnell asks, what types of opportunities would be advantageous for student athletes to be able to participate in? We talked about it. Uh, enforcing the 20 hour a week rule um, holding coaches, uh, administrators more accountable uh, for ensuring that um, there is that healthy balance um, um, and that they're working toward their academic goals and obligations. Um, I would love mandatory uh, internships for all athletes that come through that are aligned with their career interests, uh, whether it's in the off season or during the summertime. Uh, exposure to opportunities beyond sports again, would go a long ways in terms of um, ensuring that the athletes have the confidence uh, once they graduate from the university. Uh, I would love to see more athletes engaging in research projects with faculty members. Um, as they nurture that relationship, they can then talk about, what was your journey like uh, to become a faculty member? Expose them to new opportunities, new ideas. Um, Exposure leads to expansion of the mind. Expansion of the mind leads to new possibilities. And I really think that, that there should be more opportunities to expose athletes um, to, to other opportunities beyond their sport. Another question from Darnell again. <laughs> um, did you watch HBO's Ballers? And do you have any thoughts on its portrayal of athletes' lives during and after their careers? I remember ballers, but I can't say that I remember their journey from athlete to retirement or post-athletic career. So I'm sorry I can't respond on that because um, I, I just don't have enough information. <laughs> I, I, I wish they were here. Darnell, I wish you were here and you could expand upon that because I think it would be a lovely conversation. Yes, um, absolutely. Um, CARE, the uh, Center for Athletes' Rights and Equity, uh, we're always looking for uh, those who um, are advocates for, for athletes, who are interested in engaging with athletes um, across all domains, whether it's uh, you know, high school sports, college sports, or even professional sports. One quick plug. Uh, you mentioned in the importance of internships, research opportunities. We here at UC Davis agree with you, not only for our student athletes through the EVO program, but also through a, a, a new initiative called Aggie Launch, where we're trying to create experiential learning internships, research opportunities for all our students to help them uh, enter the labor market and ultimately launch into career paths. So uh, yeah. that was a nice uh, you know, <laughs> opportunity to plug. Yeah. Yes, uh, yes. We're at, almost at the end of time. If there's not any additional questions on behalf of Provost Krogan and uh, the rest of the committee and the entire uh, UC Davis uh, faculty, staff, and students, we'd like to thank you for coming uh, to visit with us thank and you. providing us your insightful uh, comments. Thank you, thank you, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.